You see me all right, okay. Well, hello everyone, thanks for coming to the sixth installment of our fall RSM speaker series. Um, we have two left in the semester. Um, next week we'll be talking about the political effects of social media with Josh Tucker and Talia Stroud um, in the US 2020 election study. Um, and we'll also be bringing in Ethan Zuckerman on the 13th to talk about the future of social media research in light of all the API changes and, and the trouble with accessing data um, from the outside of these platforms. But today we're here to talk about platforms, privacy, and power uh, with John Penny and Alexa Shore. And just a quick word of introduction. Uh, Alexa Shore is a PhD candidate in the Department of Emerging Media Studies at Boston University. Uh, her research draws on frameworks from law, media, psychology, and communication to explore the respective roles of platform design, policy, and individual preferences differences on decision making related to privacy and trust. Uh, and John is a legal scholar and social scientist based at Osgoode Hall Law School, uh, York University in Toronto. He's a faculty associate at BKC and also a former RSM visiting scholar. So we're really lucky to have them both here today. And uh, please uh, help me give them a warm welcome. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, it's uh, so I, I'm John, and this is my wonderful colleague, uh, Alexis. Um, uh, it's it's great to be back um, at Harvard's Berkman Common Center. Um, you know, it's a place that uh, I really consider sort of a a home, a community, a family away from from home. So it's. Uh, it's great to be back, and um, we're really excited about this opportunity to talk about um, this work that we've been doing on intimate um, privacy. Um, I wanted to start with a few um, quick acknowledgments. Um, first off, we wanted to acknowledge our um, colleague, uh, actually she's the project lead on this research, Danielle Citron. I'm sure most of you in this room will know her leading um, scholar, a world-renowned scholar on privacy and online abuse, and um, of course, without her vision and innovative scholarship on intimate privacy, this work would not have been possible. Um, also, the research was made possible by a grant from the Knight Foundation, which we're very thankful for, um, but also um, the Institute for Rebooting Social Media, which I was a visiting scholar at last year. Um, and that community of scholars in the broader community at the Berkman Klein Center was really important also um, to this project and the work, both two studies that we had done and thinking through the results that we're going to be talking about today, and also a new um, study that we, uh, we put together, designed, and have carried out since. Um, none of that would have been the same um, without uh, RSM and, and BKC. Um, so today we're going to be talking about this concept of intimate privacy. Um, and many of you are probably wondering, you know, what is intimate privacy? How is it different from um, more broader notions of privacy? And it's really <coughs> been Danielle's work um, on this concept that provides us with a nice, clear, and working definition. Um, essentially, intimate privacy concerns the social norms, behaviors, expectations that manage the boundaries around our intimate lives. It also concerns the degree to which others have access to information about our bodies, intimate thoughts and desires, sensitive and intimate information about our health, sexuality, and our closest personal relationships. So that includes both sensitive and intimate information, but also in the context, and we'll talk about this, in the context of intimate imagery and media as well. So when you think about intimate privacy, you think about the most sensitive, most intimate information about you. That is what intimate privacy aims to, which is, is what it's concerned with, what it aims to protect. Now, while Danielle's work has defined this in her book, and scholarship more recently, it's actually been um, a concept that's been around with us for a long time. We go back to Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis' famous article published in 1890 on the right to privacy, which essentially created the modern field of privacy law. That work often was centered on when 
legal scholars and privacy scholars talk about the background behind that really transformative piece of work, often the motivation is tied to Samuel Warren's, one of the co-authors of the piece, his wife, Mabel Bayard Warren. She was a member of high society in the Northeast and the press, uh, who, which was the mass media and press was sort of emerging this time, was very interested in her life and covering it. And so the idea often is described that the motivation for this article was um, a right to privacy to uh, that Salem Warren was concerned with, and so he enlisted his friend from law school, his friend Ice, to co author this piece, it was about her and his private life. But the reality is one of the maybe more important motivations was Samuel Warren's brother, Ned Warren, um, who at the time was just embracing his own homosexuality at a time when this was being stigmatized, even criminalized in certain jurisdictions. Samuel Warren was aware of his brother's sexual orientation and was also very concerned with protecting him and this intimate information about his life. So that's actually one of the key motivations of that piece. And if you go back and reread that article, through that lens, you can see that's a key aim um, and purpose that, that's behind that article. So why does intimate privacy matters? And I think some of our research that we've done will show you why it matters, but generally speaking, it's tied into key themes and key ideas of the center of privacy, right? notions of autonomy, development of self-identity and mutual respect. It's impossible for us to self-experiment, to develop, ourselves, our identities, our personas, without protection of this intimate information, without sharing it with our close personal others, significant partners, in a way that we know that it won't be disclosed to others without our consent. If it's not protected, if we don't have that intimate space, then we won't have that freedom to develop our identities and our autonomy and to choose our lives as we see fit. So therefore, it's also tied into notions of self-development, because the only way that we can have significant relationships with our closest partners in our lives is that we can share this kind of information. Relationships developed through mutual self-disclosure. Intimate privacy is core to that process, and trust being at the center of that as well, and intimate privacy contributes to it as well. So in this sense, it's a foundational privacy interest to others. Today, however, intimate privacy is under threat, unlike any other time in human history. Ubiquitous computing is now prying into every aspect of our lives, intimate and otherwise. Spyware, stalkerware, its use proliferation is on the rise. A recent survey done by Wowware Bytes of 1,000 Canadians and North Americans just in October found that 62% of people in a city actually monitor their partner's activities online. And that surveillance of intimate partners continued offline as well. Half of participants admitted to tracking their partners offline as well. So intimate privacy concerns online life <coughs> as well as offline. In our homes, smart appliances, the internet of things, these are all new realities where even places that were the where we could engage in the most intimate activities and have our most intimate conversations with our significant others in the privacy of our homes is now not protected from the prying ears and potential eyes of third parties through these new technologies. And of course, on top of all of this, other more flagrant antisocial behavior is also on the rise, like the disclosure of intimate imagery and information without consent like revenge porn, here is some, um, some data from the UK revenge porn helpline from 2023, wherein incidents are up 31% compared to last year, overall 13% up, and a total reports from January, September of this year, over 10,000. And that's just in the UK, not speaking, obviously, to the United States and elsewhere. And lastly, as a point before I turn things over to my, my great colleague, Alexis, um, the reality of intimate privacy violations is that they disproportionately impact on women and other minority groups. So sexual minorities, visible minorities, all of these groups are disproportionately victimized 
by intimate privacy violations. Thank you, John. So I'm um, just kind of building on what John just described. Intimate privacy has always been something really important, but today, especially in the overruling of Roe v. Wade post Dobbs now, um, there's a new reality for intimate privacy where um, there is this newfound and growing fear about um, data being accessed, intimate data being accessed by um, unknown actors. Um, and so acknowledging this importance of intimate privacy and this, this growing need to protect it, we noticed a gap in the literature and that there is um, not much, if any, empirical research that supports measures that could potentially protect intimate privacy and encourage people to express themselves intimately online without this fear um, of negative things happening to them. And so we're going to talk about two projects today. Um, the first in which is about how intimate privacy measures, um, whether that be in, um, imparted by policymakers or by platforms, impacts intimate sharing, expression, and trust. And just to parse um, sharing and expression quickly before we dive into this, um, sharing being this more broad definition of intimate privacy that Danielle Citron proposes, including things like thoughts, desires, fantasies, not just these stereotypical thoughts we have about intimate imagery and stuff like that, um, and sharing with uh, a trusted partner. Um, so broadly capturing those in our operationalization of intimate sharing and an expression focusing more concretely on more socially available, public facing um, intimate expression that one may see on social media um, that, that people engage in all the time. And so um, two separate studies within this first project that capture both of these variables and seeing differences there. And so grounding um, these studies is expressive law theory, which essentially states that laws or policy creates this form of social proof that people follow and it provides guidance for what behaviors are socially acceptable um, and what should be condemned and what sorts of behaviors are more risky than others. So there's evidence that law um, can provide this expressive or salutary effect on, on speech or in this case, intimate sharing um, in that if law were to signal that this violations of intimate privacy are not a good thing, um, people may feel more comfortable and be more likely to express themselves online. And my colleagues, uh, John and Danielle, have already found empirical evidence that uh, where this um, comes into play, such that cyber harassment law, for example, um, would impact social norms and potentially create and um, encourage victims of cyber harassment to speak and engage online. And so we wanted to understand uh, how law, um, both in policy and as proposed by platforms policy, would influence or create a salutary effect on speech. And in addition to that, what this study also wanted to do is understand how people appraise the risk um, and how they would cope with violations of intimate privacy. So this was grounded in a communication theory called protection motivation theory, which um, evaluates people's risk and people's coping appraisal to a particular situation and um, how they respond to that. So the variables here are being perceived severity, so understanding how severe of the risk of intimate engagement online, how vulnerable does it make me, um, and then going into the coping appraisal, response efficacy being, um, if, if someone were to invade my intimate privacy, would I be protected by a third party? And self-efficacy being, if this was invaded, would I be able to have the tools to protect myself? So we wanted to understand how individuals perceived the risk and their ability to cope with intimate privacy violations, both before and after um, understanding that there might be a protected intimate privacy measure. Um, and then in addition to this, finally, we wanted to incorporate partner trust as a critical variable that may um, also influence intimate expression online. So trust has been studied in combination with protection motivation theory previously. So I mean, naturally theoretically fit here. Um, and also just um, as, as Danielle has described in her book and other work that trust is really a critical component that is necessary to establish prior to um, expressing yourself intimately online. And so um, the first study we did here, um, as I previously kind of described, was a longitudinal study um, to see the impact of legal and platform-based measures. So um, proposed by the government or proposed by the platform, we wanted to see if there would be a difference there in how people responded in terms of their intimate expression. So we wanted to see what intimate privacy measures create a salutary effect on intimate um, sharing and how do perceptions of risk about this sort of um, sharing and partner trust change both um, after knowledge of intimate privacy measures. 
And then specifically, um, as John mentioned, there is this disproportionate impact on minority groups. So we wanted to understand how these questions applied specifically to victims of online abuse and women victims of online abuse. Um, and just to um, further describe this legal intervention, um, we described the participants um, that there would be like legal consequences to things like recording or sharing to the imagery without consent, holding social media companies accountable by the law. Um, and then the platform intervention would um, be predominantly focused on what the platform would do. Um, and we described, we based it in existing um, privacy measures that platforms have um, taken. So this was all grounded in real um, policy or platform interventions. And then study two was um, focusing on intimate expression. So whereas study one operationalized the sharing as more broad um, thoughts and fantasies with a, a partner, um, inclusive of a bunch of different things, this was more focused on intimate expression on social media and accessible to wider circles. And using the same sort of interventions, um, wanting to see how this would affect that sort of expression. And study two um, was not a longitudinal study, so it was just um, participants um, came to the experiment, they saw the intervention, and we asked them um, these questions about how their expression would change. And so I'll pass to John to go over the key findings here. Great. So, you know, going back to thinking through some of the, the key gaps in the, gaps in the literature that, that Alexis mentioned, I mean, more broadly speaking, there's very little work that's been done on intimate privacy, um, both in terms of platform-based measures, legal measures, theorizing it, and certainly because there's been very little actual protective work being done by platforms, both in law and in regulation, there's been very little study of the impacts of those. Um, and that's really one of the key aims of the study, to understand these impacts in a comparative sense. So in study one, some of our key findings, you can see the size of our uh, representative US-based sample. Here's some of the key findings. What we found, interestingly, there was no difference in perceptions of risk or intimate sharing as a result of proposals by government, or the legal measures, the platform-based measures, or a descriptor that combined both. So the impacts we saw, there was really no difference. When it came to the findings in terms of the intervention, partner trust, so trust and response efficacy. So in PMT theory, response efficacy is the perception that a third party will take steps to address the threat. These turned out to be a key part of the story. That is, they predicted greater intimate sharing, especially post intervention. That is, after the intervention, trust became a stronger predictive. So the predictive power for the variables was strongest in particular for female victims of online abuse. When it came to study to, oh, here it is. A last really interesting finding, and this sort of tracks the broader concern that intimate privacy violations disproportionately impact on marginal communities and minority communities. We actually found that the interventions had a significant and um, uh, impact post-intervention on specific minority groups. So Hispanics generally, but especially women, Asian South Pacific participants, and African-American prior victims of online abuse. So there was a real impact with the interventions having a salutary impact. So this is not about deterring intimate privacy violations. It's putting these protections in place and seeing how that impacts on the sharing of participants in the study. In study two, which Alexis nicely set out, it focused on intimate expression, some more public facing expression, also some interesting findings. So compared to the government measures, Participants exposed to platform-based measures had higher levels of intimate online expression. So interestingly, in study two, when it came to intimate expression online, platform measures had a greater impact. Secondly, as we've seen throughout the study, that trust is really important. So trust in technology and government were positive predictors of intimate expression. 
Also tracking what we know about online abuse and intimate privacy violations and some of the social norms and stigmatization around it, females were less significantly less likely to engage in intimate online expression. And we also found some other interesting findings. So for example, participants who had a higher degree of experience with online abuse reported higher level levels of intimate online expression. There's different ways that we, we've interpreted that finding. One way to interpret that is there's some people who feel more free and less concerned with the risks of intimate online expression, they become targets of online abuse and intimate privacy violations. But also at the same time, those who are engaging in it, maybe they have a lower sense of risk and maybe some of the interventions might have happened. And lastly, although this was a smaller subsample within the broader population, we found that non-binary participants, so participants who identified as non-binary, were significantly less likely to trust their partners across the different interventions. I think what that shows you, again, is how minority groups, in this case, a sexual minority, um, is disproportionately impacted by the risks and threats centered on intimate privacy violations. So let me hand it back over to Alexis to talk about the second study, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the key takeaways um, a bit later. Yeah, so thank you, John, for going over those key findings. Um, so our second project um, specifically focused on um, period tracking applications, which um, became a very popular topic of discussion following the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the intimate privacy um, concerns that may correspond with that. So for those of you not familiar, this would be an example of a period tracking application. Basically what it does is allow women to track their menstrual cycles, whether that be simple things like knowing what date that it's going to come and end, or things like tracking emotional and physical symptoms that correspond with um, your cycle. Um, also, some period tracking applications have a social component where you can engage with other women um, to understand your symptoms better. They have educational resources. Um, all is to say, these tools um, are used by so many women. Um, Femtech as an industry is projected, projected to be about a $1.1 billion industry in 2024. This is a huge industry. These applications are super important to women to help um, understand their bodies over the course of a month. Um, but so when um, Roe v. Wade was overturned, um, abortion was banned in states across the country. And corresponding with that, people started talking about how the data collected by period tracking applications was going to work in a, a post-Roe v. Wade climate. Would this, would, these, would this data be accessible to law enforcement? Um, period tracking applications also often um, collect location data, so there was this concern about law enforcement knowing, um, being able to connect location data and reproductive health data. Um, there were articles galore about the leading period tracking applications. Researchers started studying um, period tracking application privacy pol policies, finding that the majority of them collect um, and share data with their parties. So there were all these concerns about period tracking applications, particularly post -dobs. Um And so the central question of this research project was how can we build a period tracking app that respects intimate privacy, particularly post dogs And as I mentioned, these apps are so important. So the answer to should I delete my period tracking application should not be yes, because this is really important to women. We need to understand how we can design these applications in a way that doesn't um, end up violating women's intimate privacy. And so um, leading this kind of project, was it, is it going to be policy that we should lead with? Is it trust, as we found in the previous study? Or maybe is it um, aspects of the design? And so um, this research was kind of guided through uh, literature on technological affordances. And so what affordances are, are not necessarily features of the design. So we're not talking about colors or buttons. We're talking about um, subjective perceptions about the possibilities for action within an application. So there are aspects of this application that make me feel like I can participate in it or behave in a certain way. And privacy scholars in particular have noted the importance of affordances um, as being critical to information management decisions. So noting that it's not just about um, personality traits or the like that influence people's behaviors, but it is affordances of the design. So um, particularly focusing on two affordances that we believe would um, allow people to feel safer and be able to disclose with a period tracking application anonymity being like having no connection to one's personal identity 
and persistence being um, the data would not like persist for longer than it needed to, it would be deleted eventually. Um, both of these within the literature have been supported to um, support self-disclosure online. And so as we mentioned, trust is so important here, particularly post-ops and especially with period tracking applications. Without trust, um, these, the design might not matter if they don't trust that the application is going to keep their data safe. So we have literature um, to support that trust may actually mediate the relationship between these technological affordances like anonymity and persistence and the eventual disclosure with a period tracking application. And so what our experiment did was we created this hypothetical new period tracking application um, and the experiment manipulated different platform policy reforms. And so um, these, similar to the previous study, mimicked real policy. So one being a right to be forgotten, which would anonymize data, or sorry, it would uh, lack persistence of data. The identification would anonymize data, um, and the HIPAA rule um, mimicked um, something that would um, law enforcement would not be able to get access to the data. You wouldn't be able to connect it to different third parties. And there was a control group as well um, within the experiment. Um, we also um, and then following the intervention, we also quantitatively measured perceptions of affordances and other sorts of control variables, such as privacy risk, um, previous disclosure habits, previous use of a period tracking application. Um, and then finally, um, we wanted to not only understand intended intimate disclosure with a period tracking application, but also if people would actually use this. So given that we were framing it as like a hypothetical period tracking app, basically at the end of the experiment, we asked, like, would you like a link to download this app? Um, and that's how we got at their revealed behavior of intended usage. So um, some key findings that I'll quickly go over. So there were no significant differences across manipulated policy on any of the measured variables. So this is very similar to the previous project where the policy manipulations didn't do anything uh, in terms of how people ended up disclosing. We found that trust fully mediated what was a positive relationship between perceptions of anonymity and intimate disclosure, which means that um, anonymity was fully, you needed trust for this relationship between anonymity and intimate disclosure to um, be significant. We also found that trust partially mediated what was a negative relationship between perceptions of persistence and intimate disclosure. Um, and finally, another key finding was that the mean probability of deciding to use cycle track, the period tracking application, was 1.95 times higher with increased perceptions of trust in cycle track. And so as I mentioned, we also collected some uh, qualitative responses for, just to understand um, People, we didn't ask about post-dogs, but we asked, for example, how has your period tracking app um, use changed in the past year? And we actually got some uh, responses relating to the Dobbs decision. So I'm just going to, there are a few that I just want to read because I think they're so interesting. Um, one being, since Roe v. Wade was overturned and women's re reproductive rights have been at risk in many parts of the country, I have made sure to only use my period app in anonymous or offline mode. Um, sometimes I don't put in all the days of my period or something like that on purpose, so not really wanting them to have accurate information. Um, I have many privacy concerns, but I need the app, so I still log pretty much the same information as before. So we're seeing kind of a range of reflections. Um, and this one I found particularly interesting because this quote basically indicates that even if the period tracking app was to implement all these protections, they don't really trust that that's true. Um, in the current climate, I don't trust this kind of information is not actually being accessed and shared online. Um, so just really interesting um, quotes from our participants. And one of the other qualitative questions we asked was, what would be the ideal period tracker event? And a lot of the responses indicating wanting it to be stripped down as much as possible, um, offline, anonymous, mm -hmm. options to delete, to store data. So really reflecting some of the the affordances that we were interested in, this was reflected in what participants thought would be the ideal period tracking app. They also mentioned wanting to have educational resources, whether it be from other women or doctors um, on the period tracking app, so that they could you know, better understand their cycle. Right, so um, I'll begin speaking to some of the key takeaways and then Alexis can also sort of supplement and and um, based on the, the second study. Um, so some of the, the things that we took away, and you know, I'm sure some of you will have different takeaways from some of those findings, but the first sort of headline for us was um, platform power. Um, that is the extent when it came to intimate privacy and the impact of different measures taken, either there was no difference in impacts 
um, between the government or legal regulatory measures and the platform based measures, or the platform based measures had a greater effect. So one way of thinking about this is that at the front line, if you want to deal with intimate privacy, protect it to have the, the most positive impact on users. Um, it's going to be through the platforms that are designed. And I think regulations and laws that are tailored towards that. Rather than sort of a standalone regulation that's over here, I think if you want to reach users, it's going to be through the platforms themselves. So maybe this finding actually justifies the Institute for Good and Social Media. The focus should be social media platforms and dealing with these problems. Um, a second key takeaway really is the central importance of trust in, in this story. Trust predicted intimate sharing and expression um, and also was a key outcome of some of the intimate privacy protections um, that we looked at, in particular for, as we saw, certain minority groups. The importance of trust in both intimate sharing and expression of what the literature tells us is that, you know, this is not something that happens overnight, right? And that's part of why we have some of the limits in the longitudinal study. If you build trust among users, then over time, trust in their partners, trust within social groups, and trust in platforms, expression, intimate sharing will come later once you've built that trust. So trust is, should be the target for a lot of, I think, policies and design affordances going forward. Um, the form of intimate expression matters. Um, what we found was that, for example, when it came to more social or public facing intimate expression, that's beyond just one-to-one -one partner sharing, um, platforms were more important, but there was greater stigma attached to that kind of expression, not surprisingly. Um, that was different from our findings in the first study, which focused on intimate partnership, which ended up with different findings, not surprisingly as well. And lastly, I think another key takeaway or key part of our findings is the importance in how intimate privacy protections um, benefit in particular women and minority groups, users who previously have experienced online abuse, which tracks with, of course, the fact that these are also groups that we've seen also reflected in our findings are disproportionately impacted by the stigma and perceptions of risks and threat around intimate sharing and expression, both sexual minorities and other kinds of minority groups as well. Oh. Yeah, I guess, well, I, I guess I will just, one thing to add to this is I think a, a common critique of intimate privacy is just to not share intimate information online. Like, just don't put it online. <laughs> don't use a period tracking app. Don't do any of that stuff. Um, and that, I think, our work helps to start thinking about is that shouldn't be the, the response. People use digital tools to talk, to express themselves, to develop, to learn. We need these tools. And so part of our work is attempting to start the conversation and try to develop solutions for how to build platforms with intimate privacy um, in mind. Yeah, and I think in terms of um, public policy matters, um, and this is coming back to some of the, the gaps in, in, in not just the literature, but research on impact. Um, I mean, there are statutes across a number of states that attempt to address a certain kind of intimate privacy violation that's revenge porn, right? And the challenge, of course, with laws and regulations that deal with intimate privacy expression is of course there's the political um, constraints where law enforcement and politicians have shown little interest in protecting it. Where it has been done, there's also legal and constitutional restraints. Often these laws are challenged based on constitutional grounds for some amendment grounds. Now, revenge porn statutes in a number of states have recently been upheld, been upheld um, based on First Amendment. Uh, on First Amendment grounds, including most recently in Minnesota. Um, so there are these legal and policy constraints on these kinds of laws. But I think what our findings show is 
is that yes, these laws are important, they're a critical part of the story, but also policies that are targeting social media platforms. Um, if you want to have a positive impact on users and protect the users in the sense, then it's going to be design affordances, it's going to be reforms on laws that impact on social media. And yes, something that Danielle has been advocating for is at long last looking at Section 230 reform, and we think our findings show the wisdom of that as well. Yeah. And I think lastly, in terms of some of our additional policy recommendations, um, uh, another one is being that when we think about the actual victims, we see that intimate privacy protections, they help um, women and marginalized communities disproportionately impacted by this. But what that also means is they should also be the center of these design efforts and these legal and policy efforts. So for these, we need to center these smaller minority and marginal communities. They need to be part of the reform process, the design process. We need those voices in this process, and that has not been the case, either in the broader reforms we're seeing across the country, the few reforms that we've seen, but certainly not on the design side. And that's what we really aim to with the second study is to center that. And I think that some of the last findings, uh, and I'll just speak to one and, and Alexis, you did, just in thinking through um, a lot of this is long term, that since trust is a key part of the story, um, it's something that you have to build and maintain over time. So that means you can pass new measures, you can have new design affordances, but they have to be enforced, they have to be maintained. Um, it's not something they can have a one-off. And over time, in the long run, you'll have greater protections. And in the end, I think users that are better protected, more engaged and feeling more protected. Yeah, um, and I think that, so some of the, the other things that we've saw through is, so at the beginning we mentioned that there's really a lack of empirical research that supports this sort of stuff. So um, I think more empirical research to showcase how to protect intimate privacy online Particularly, um, we did a longitudinal study um, that was two weeks and it was um, not based on like a real platform. So it would be great to substantiate our interventions and some of our recommendations with longitudinal testing over an even longer period of time, maybe through field testing an actual product and seeing how um, actual behaviors change would be um, really um, significant to understand. Um, and then in terms of design, um, understanding how we can stop violations before they can even happen, prioritizing safety and privacy as a default setting um, without having people having to go through hoops or um, chilling their, their speech um, to have the experience they want on online. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, social media, as many of you are studying, I don't think can fulfill its real potential without protecting intimate privacy. This is protecting intimate privacy is a positive thing for social media because people will feel safer wanting to engage, being able to connect better and more so with, with their network online. So um, just, yeah, um, prioritizing intimate privacy on platforms, I think is beneficial for both the individual users, um, particularly these minority individuals that are impacted most, um, and also ultimately, I think, the platforms. Absolutely. And I think we can we can end it there. We, we very much look forward to um, your questions. We're going to be continuing this research and we're thinking through what our what our next study might be. Um, so we, we welcome thoughts on these findings and um, anything else. So thank thanks. you. Great. Um, before opening up to the room, I'll just quickly, uh, there's a, a, a good question online, which I know Danielle has a lot of thoughts on, but first, uh, welcome your thoughts as well. Uh, would you recommend any changes to Section 230 to address some of the harms that you're seeing and studying? Yeah, I can, I can feel that more. So, um, yes, um, absolutely. Um, and, and I would say that um, some of the changes that, that Danielle has been advocating, um, which essentially imposes some additional clear responsibility on platforms to better deal with um, you know, a range of different content. Um, but I think even if you were, we were to form based, reform based on our findings, it would be you focus on the most harmful kind of content. 
And I think content that relates to our intimate lives, so intimate imagery, the most personal and sensitive intimate information. There's a way that you can modestly modify Section 230. It still provides for protections for the platform from suit and certain kinds of immunity, but also at long last imposes some additional responsibilities to deal with intimate content that's going to better protect users. And I think in the long run, as Alexis nicely put there, is better for the platform, it's better for the users, clearly. Um, it's going to lead to a broader cross-section of users feeling more freely to speak, more freely to engage. That was a finding we see here, and a finding that Danielle and I found in our 2019 study looking at cyber harassment laws, which are often critiqued as potentially having a chilling effect. In fact, we saw the opposite in that study. We see the opposite here, where these kinds of laws don't chill, but it, especially for users who are disproportionately victimized for these kinds of violations, they're more willing to speak and engage. So often Section 230 is defended as being key to speech and expression. In fact, with some modest reforms, I think we can see a broader, more rich and diverse conversation and a more protected and engaged user base. Hi, very interesting and very informative talk. I'm not from the law, I'm from biology. So my, my basic interest is in the interest in the subject. So now, when you mention about minorities in this country, you should also think that some of these minorities are majorities elsewhere. For example, Hindus in this country, and in, they are quite majority in India. And whenever it was required, they are able to impose some restrictions on the social media, opposed, which is opposed by the minorities, but the majority is expressing their will. So the government was has been successful in imposing such restriction on the social media. Look at the graduate students who come from China. They do not know anything about Tiananmen Square. Even the people in this country know about it, there it is now. So I am just wondering, unlike the gun control, which cannot be totally passed because of the is the social media restriction, is it at the same level of fundamental right or can it be restricted? So, I, I mean, I can, I can, I can give a shot and you can. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a great question and you're right. We have to be, be careful whenever we're thinking through new kinds of restrictions that can be used and abused. Um, and I think you're speaking to the, the BJP um, government in, in India. Um, and you're absolutely right that the kinds of changes that Danielle talks about, and I think would be supported by our findings, are going to be pretty modest and tailored and specific to certain kinds of more harmful um, content that speaks to the most sensitive kind of an intimate information um, that protects those fundamental privacy interests that um, we talked about um, at the outset. Um, certainly, I think social media concerns certain fundamental rights, of course, expression, engagement, association, all of these. But on the other side of that, um, what the privacy scholarship and research shows is that you need a foundation of privacy for all of those interests, right? um, intellectual privacy and intimate privacy, right? which you can't have with overreaching government in an increasingly authoritarian government, perhaps in, in, in India. So you're absolutely right that we have to be careful with the reforms, but I think you can, we can do it in a limited way. And I think right now, interestingly, there's almost a consensus across the political spectrum about the need for more accountability for platforms. Now, maybe the left and the right disagree, what that looks like in the end, but certainly probably at any other point, there's more agreement on the need for more platform accountability. And I think maybe sometimes when it comes to consensus, less is more, but when it comes to intimate privacy, I think the greater the protection, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, there are political constraints and legal constraints. Danielle's well aware of it in her work and she discusses that. And I think it's a reality of our implications as well. 
Um, but I think this can be tailored to avoid some of those abuses. Yeah, that's I, just to add a little bit to that. I think that um, the platform reforms, like John mentioned, would be modest. Like a, some of the ones that we're suggesting from our study, they wouldn't require the platform to necessarily feel restricted or restrict use. Um, they are simply, you know, adjusting some of their design affordances so that users can feel more safe to express themselves. I don't think that the reforms would necessarily alter the dynamic of platforms in a negative way. All it's really doing is prioritizing the user um, without taking too much away from the platform. I think that there's a balance that like discussions with platform designers um, could find with what the users really want, because ultimately, um, like users need to use these platforms to express themselves. There's so much more that's happening online than what's happening offline um, that people like rely on these platforms. So um, I think eventually platforms will have to, you know, step towards what the users want to, in order to find a balance. Um, the existing platforms will have to, otherwise I think new platforms will come and, and do that and take the old platforms away. And maybe just add one finer, final point. I think this also speaks to maybe the first question, Nick, that came from online. I mean, part of this is I think a lot of platforms are willing to do um, to be more responsible. I think increasingly that's the case, but inevitably there's going to be some platforms where intimate information and imagery, like sites that literally monetize revenge porn, um, are out there. And you can't get to those unless you have some kind of legal policy reform. I think the language that Danielle proposes, and I think makes a lot of sense, is simply requiring reasonable steps, reasonable measures to deal with this. And that's a standard that's familiar to us in all areas of law. It's not going to create uncertainty and blow up the social media ecosphere. We all have duties imposed by tort law to take reasonable steps. That's all that's being proposed here to deal with a specific kind of content. Awesome. Uh, two more questions from online, and we'll hand it over to Dylan. Um, one is, uh, is it possible to access the studies that you're talking about or um, from online? So if you're planning on publishing them soon or if there's preprints available. And then also a, a clarification, um, in the key takeaways, you mentioned that the platform measures have an equal or greater impact than government measures. Uh, could you please clarify if the, if the impact refers to the likelihood of a user disclosing intimate information or the level of privacy protection provided to a user? So on the, I mean, I'll, I'll, on the on, on the former question, you can you can take the um, the former. Oh, sorry. What was the first question again? Oh, accessible to the paper. Yeah. So sorry. Um, the uh, so the we have a paper that's based on the first two um, studies that's currently under peer review. Um, so we hope to have that available soon, and we'll put the data and everything up on GitHub as a part of that process. Um, and we're really in the process now of deciding with the, the third study or the second project uh, where we might place it. Yeah, yeah. So all hopefully forthcoming soon. And then on the second uh, question about um, what the platform was, what the users were responding to better in terms of the platform versus the government, that was in response to um, they were more likely to intimately express themselves online in response to the platform, the measure taken by the platform um, in contrast to that taken by the government. So they felt more, I guess, protected and feeling that they can express themselves more so um, as a result of the platform taking action as compared to the government taking action. Thanks so much, folks. Um, the question I have around trust, it seems like that's a pretty like, integral part to a lot of this. I guess I'm wondering, how do you square that like need, maybe desire for trust with the, I guess, like general feeling that there's an erosion of trust, not just with social media platforms, but like institutions, both in the United States and globally. I said, I guess to that point also, have you have you seen or heard of studies where folks are trying to test how to build trust, I guess particularly with social media platforms, given that, I don't know, I think there was a point about folks, um, you know, like folks, the platforms generally like care about the users, but like there's also this dichotomy with platforms also using the users as like data mines and like whatever other other metaphors you want to have for it. So I'm wondering if you've thought about that at all. That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really tough question. That's like the question. How do you build trust when people just so badly don't trust the, the platforms in the government? I mean, we saw just that one quote and there were several other participants that expressed similar sentiments in that no matter what the platform says, there's still this inherent, I don't trust you um, because of the current political climate. 
And so I think that's where we kind of start thinking about how do we embed trust in policy? How do we like have uh, platforms express loyalty to users um, through policy as, as required by policy? And I think that it, it is kind of like a trickle down effect that um, even if we are developing trust at the platform level, there might still be this need to have trust at the policy level. And that's only going to come from more policy making. Yeah, yeah. And I think what our, our findings show is that, um, you know, in particular from, from, from study one, that these, in, when we're thinking through a different kind of trust, and so not necessarily trust in the platforms or the trust um, in, in the, the social media and companies that are out there, um, but certainly trust to the extent that you trust to share this information with your partner via social media and, and other platforms that was impacted by these interventions, right? Even though there was no difference between um, the government or the platform based measures. So we saw results on that count. The trust was increased. It hadn't yet impacted on the actual, you know, immediately on the sharing and the expression, but it impacted on the trust, which is key to that over the long run. So some of what we tested, I think, is part of the story. But I think your question is quite right that it's about building into the platforms um, new affordances, which we passed in the third step. It's going to build that trust over time. But it's not going to be, I think, an easy solution. It's going to be comprehensive for the very reason that your, your question has that trust in institutions and in platforms is at its lowest point for good reason. How that trust has been violated, how our data has been misappropriated and violent, all of that, the intimate privacy violations that we talk about that motivated the study is all a part of that challenge. And I think this is going to be industry being more responsible. It's going to be users educated. It's going to be um, maybe the general public also educated. Um, lawmakers and policymakers um, being more responsible about this in the long run. So there's no simple or quick solution. I just want to add one quick note to that um, in terms of trust that um, in addition to trusting the platform, I think John kind of mentioned this in terms of trusting the people on the platforms too. So I think that and platforms want users to engage with each other and it's hard to build that trust interpersonally when there's this lack of trust in the greater body that they're operating within. But I think it's important to also recognize that in addition to the institutional violations of intimate privacy, often like these violations of intimate privacy happen at the interpersonal level too. And I think that that speaks to the norms that have been established on the platforms where these right. sorts of violations are a normal thing to do. It's something that can happen. And so starting, so building trust at the platform level and the platform designing themselves in a way that it is no longer normal or acceptable to violate each other on an interpersonal level will then trickle down to these interpersonal intimate privacy violations as well. Absolutely. I mean, one of the, the theoretical frame, the theoretical key part of the theoretical framework for this work is expressive law theory, which is a body of literature that Alexis described the answer through NICE, which examines this other function of law. We think of law as a deterring conduct, but there's a lot of empirical work on its expressive function, that it sends a message when you implement protective measures, both in law, um, and this research shows that sending symbolic messages impacts on social norms or changes behavior in the long term. One of the interesting, I think, outcomes of our studies is that platforms also have an expressive impact, right? I think these protective measures deter antisocial behavior, and that's a positive. But our research is also concerned with how implementing these measures sends a message about what kind of engagement and sharing is valued, what will be protected, and the kinds of behavior increases the risk for engaging in behavior that these measures send a message of disapproval on. Right? So I think in the long run, it's not just about building trust, but changing the norms and stigma around this kind of sharing and changing the norms about intimate privacy violations, which is, the, I think, the ultimate goal of what we want to do. Thanks for this. Really interesting. Um, kind of going off of Dylan's question, I suppose. I guess for me, the track following what you presented is okay, you trust is good. Trust equals more engagement, 
more engagement equals better bottom line for companies. Like, how do you kind of square, you know, surveillance capitalism with, like, we're talking about privacy and increasing trust. I can see that your research is probably very um, interesting for platforms as well. For me, I, I'm not putting this very well, but there's there's something there in terms of attention that I just don't understand how you could, if you can give me like specific examples if you already thought through this. Um, yeah, like I'm not, I think there's a difference between, you know, historical inequalities that come with that public-private divide, especially around gender. But do we really want to be nudged to share more of this sort of thing with these platforms? Like, do we really want to accept that they are the new public sphere and kind of ignore their bottom line? I, like, for me, there's a tension here that I'm not quite getting past. Sure, no, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, and certainly the, the aim here is not to, our research is not to aid surveillance capitalism and help companies monetize. Although, you know, I think one of the messages that we say is that like, if you implement these protections, um, it doesn't, isn't contrary to the interests of platforms, because that's often the kind of pushback that we get from the industry side. Um, the idea here is people increasingly share and increasingly express today. It's a reality that people use these platforms to connect with their significant others. And they're going to be sharing intimate information and expressing intimately. That's just a reality. It's not going to stop. TikTok It's not going to get banned. And so if that's the reality and there's great stigma and um, perceived threats and risks, especially for different marginal and minority communities, um, how can we reduce um, the stigma attached to these, this kind of activity that's happening. Um, and it's key to mutual self-disclosure, autonomy, self-identity and expression. All that is important. It's now happening via these platforms. So if that is happening, how can we make it safer for different communities? And that's not to me in the end about helping platforms. It's about helping privacy and helping those communities. Um, and that means not necessarily the aim is a nudging for people to be sharing more. The idea here is people are sharing more. How can we make that more safe and protected from disproportionate violations that are happening? And in the long term, change the norms so there's less abuse and less targeting. But I, I appreciate their, their, their is that reality that we're making a pitch to platforms and you know if people are sharing more then you might say well then um that leads to feeds into the surveillance capitalism machine our hope is that these constrictions can are not feeding the machine but helping the people yeah i think you put it great um i'll just add a little bit i think that some of the design recommendations also are trying to kind of pull back on the amount, the level of surveillance capitalism that is currently happening at the platform level. So with the example of the period tracking application, the idea right. would be to de-identify people, disconnect that, um, allow data to be deleted um, after a certain period of time so that there isn't as much um, of the surveillance capitalism that we're so concerned about. I, I completely agree with what John said about like, this is happening. So how do we make it as best as it can be? Um, I think it's, it's a little it's harder to envision like from like a an adult perspective where this has happened as we've grown up but our children are growing up in a world where this is what it is and this is the public sphere um so how can we make it safer for our children um because there there is no option really for them to just not to disengage and so that's why we have to keep talking to the, with the platforms and how we design it in the best way for them yeah and I, and I think the findings from the design study too like the feedback was some people change their behavior post ops Some of the participants, some of the women said, yeah, I'm not using my peer tracking app. And we have an additional study that um, we're still working on that we, we look at impacts post dogs on um, certain kinds of chilling effects and those findings track with that. Um, but um, there's also a clear indication that many users also, although they have greater privacy concerns, say, I just need to use this app that's really helpful for what I want to do. So if that's the reality, how can we have policies and measures that may be mandated by law to ensure that that data is not, information is not shared with third parties, 
including with law enforcement, including with other companies, and that that data should be anonymized and it shouldn't have persistence over a period of time. So I think those kinds of measures, you can see the concrete benefit to those users who can't disconnect, are not gonna stop using the apps. They're gonna use it and we can make them more protected and safe with these kinds of changes. Hi, um, thank you. Um, there's been a proliferation of like apps uh, tracking mental health status and uh, and also treatment, including like live therapy and stuff like that. And there's also already been abuses by the companies uh, doing them. I just wondered whether you looked at that aspect in particular, and uh, if so, whether there was anything kind of unique about it within this realm, or whether it followed the same pattern that you outlined in your talk. Um, yeah. So we, the study was focused predominantly on uh, period tracking application, but I did look, we did look a little bit at like just the digital health industry in general and um, how people have become really comfortable with sharing information with these digital health providers and companies as opposed to going to their doctor and that data is, is there. Um, but we haven't necessarily looked deep into the differences between sharing mental health data and uh, menstrual or reproductive health data, but um, I'm sure that there are probably patterns and similarities and also probably differences, but um, that's a really interesting comparator that I think would be useful to explore. Yeah, and I think maybe that's another sort of step. We began because we thought post ops that you're really interested, given some of the concerns that were expressed immediately following the decision, that it would be salient to look at that kind of um, app. And because there, and there was really literally nothing done, a little bit yeah. done on um, post ops privacy perceptions. Uh, but nothing done in terms of concrete in the app. So we thought that would be salient and timely right now. But I think a natural next study was to would be to look at these design affordances with with health um, um, more broadly, because I think that also um, overlaps with the core part of intimate privacy, right? Which is not just um, sexual privacy. It's not just um, you know a certain kind of application. It's more broad than that, and certainly health information is goes to the core of intimate privacy. Great, well, we're a little past one o'clock, but there's a few last online questions if you guys are willing to take those. Sure. Awesome, okay. Um, first, are there any period tracking apps that meet the requirements that you recommend? Um, another guest is wondering about your ideas on privacy designation, especially related to your topic. And then perhaps a good uh, question to end on, um, if governments won't regulate and platforms won't act unless shame to, and even then they'll only act minimally, uh, what do you imagine will create an impetus for change in this sort of space? These are all great but hard questions. Yeah. Um, do you want to think the first question, do any period tracking apps exist that meet all these requirements? No. Um, so there have been a few studies that have evaluated policies and practices of a plethora of period tracking applications, all of which they find are sharing more than they need to or collecting more than they need to. Um, so as of right now, there are no like ideal period tracking apps that are meeting the requirements that the participants in our study would, would want. So there's definitely, I think, room for femtech to evolve in a way that starts to prioritize the reality of the world post jobs. The second question had to do with privacy designations. Could you, could you um, I, I don't know if that was a typo for from design oh, um, okay. or uh, maybe Alyssa would have honestly know more about this. Um, I'm, I, that was that's the question. What, what, can you repeat the question just so I hear you? Just your thoughts on privacy designation, especially on your topic. Okay, so I think it'd be the, the privacy designs, right? Um, if if it if because I'm not sure about privacy designations, but probably probably privacy um, designs, and I think that that speaks to some of the affordances that we tested in um, the second project in the third study that we, we talked about here, which looked at what we tried to do is we matched these affordances um, to specific policy proposals that you typically see debated, right to be forgotten, which is about persistence of data over time, uh, or, or preventing persistence over time, anonymization. And I think in our findings, and then the third was the new HIPAA DHS proposed um, rule which would constrain how health, certain kinds of health information could be available to law enforcement. Um, we found with the first two affordances the most significant impact on trust and trust being the mediating um, impact on 
the intimate um, disclosure that we tested in, in that study. So we think at least from those, even though there's, I think more research needs to be done, at least when it came to this period tracking cycle track app that we created in, in hypothetical or in, in, in imagination, um, at least for that design, anonymization and lack of persistence were important um, design affordances that we, we would recommend uh, as a starting point for intimate privacy protection. Yeah, and I think that, like John said, it's just a starting point. Obviously, we can't test all of the privacy enhancing affordances in one study. So I think that, though, given the power of some of these design affordances and the mediating role of trust, um, that might pave way to testing some more theoretically um, supported privacy enhancing affordances yeah, in design. Absolutely. The last question, of course, is a, is a great one, but a, but a tough one. Right? Um, because the reality is, and I think Danielle literally just came out with a new piece in the Yale Law Journal talking about how when it comes to online harms and online abuse, there still is a lack of action um, among governments and among industry. Um, and although, of course, you see some, you know, um, optimism, so I guess some data points for hope in certain places the fact that through advocacy of groups like ccri um, which i'm on the advisory board for and danielle is on the executive um, which litigates some of these claims but also advocates for law reforms in states and have been um, actually designed the um, model statute behind a lot of the state adopted revenge porn statutes that have been adopted in states and have withheld um, First Amendment scrutiny within courts so far, including, as I mentioned most recently, um, in Minnesota. Um, so I think part of, of those efforts is public education campaigns, right? Um, part of that is educating policymakers um, about um, the value for the general public, in particular, disproportionately affected um, groups, these kinds of protections can help. That they don't chill speech. We saw no evidence of that. That it's not about chilling engagement or chilling speech, which is usually why these kinds of measures are challenged and opposed politically. In fact, they have a salutary effect on these. For women, and as we find in this study, can increase trust, which over the long term can lead to greater expression uh, in sharing for groups that are disproportionately targeted with intimate privacy violations. So um, public education campaigns, um, along with educating law enforcement and other enforcement agencies who often, even when you enact laws, aren't doing enough. So part of this is ensuring that those communities understand the threat and the harm to do action. And lastly, I think, education for users as well, to take steps to protect themselves, to understand the threat that's out there. Um, like, for example, we found in one of our studies, in study two, where users who are more often um, uh, victimized by online abuse um, also um, were more likely to uh, correlate it with greater engagement with intimate expression. So there you see the clear risk. If you're engage in this public facing expression, you're going to be targeted for this kind of abuse. And so, you know, people have to understand better these risks. And that's for privacy more generally, but in particular for intimate privacy. And if users start voting with their feet, again, um, post Dobbs, there was some evidence of users switching period tracking apps, for example, and seeking out um, apps that had better privacy protections. Um, post noted, at least for a period of time, people chose um, certain browsers that had more greater anonymity. Um, so the public, when there's media coverage of these kinds of threats and harms, there is shift and people will vote with their feet. And I think when they do, platforms will behave more responsibly. Um, but we need to push lawmakers and we need to push Awesome. Well, thank you, Alexis. Thank you, John. Thanks to our in-person audience and also all the great questions from online. Um, we're here next week and the week after, and we hope to see you guys then. So, Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.